The first of the polynomial theorems is the remainder theorem, which is kind of neat uh, if you understand what it's saying. So first off, this is what the theorem says. If a polynomial function f of x is divided by x minus k, the remainder is r, which also equals f of k. So what this means is that synthetic division can be used to evaluate a polynomial function. And that's called synthetic substitution. And that's like a, a consequence of this theorem. So instead of plugging in the k value into the function and squaring it, cubing it, fifth powering it, whatever, uh, you can just do synthetic division and you will get your value. So let's look at an example. So if I say find f of negative 2 when f of x equals 3x cubed plus 8x squared plus 5x minus 7, you can go ahead and plug in negative 2 into that, into that, into that, and use the order of operations, or you can use the remainder theorem. Um, so by the remainder theorem, I can set up a synthetic division, which means this thing here is my remainder. And so therefore, by the remainder theorem, f of negative 2 equals negative 9. And if I want to verify it, then I go ahead and do the 3, negative 2 to the third power, plus 8, times negative 2 to the second power, plus 5, times negative 2, minus 7. And that also gives me negative 9. So that's Once you have the remainder theorem, a natural progression from that is this factor theorem. And it says a polynomial f of x has a factor x minus k if and only if f of k equals 0. So uh, we've been taking advantage of this theorem forever. So if I know, for example, that negative 2 uh, is a 0, then I know that x minus negative 2 is a factor. And that's what the factor theorem says. So whenever I told you that like negative 2 and 3 were roots, then you knew that you can say x plus 2 and x minus 3 were factors, right? And that's what the factor theorem tells you. Um, and so when you do synthetic division and you get a remainder of 0 in your synthetic division, that means you actually have one of the factors of that polynomial. And then we're going to use that to solve polynomials of degree higher than 2. So for example, if I have f of x equals 2x to the fourth plus 7x cubed minus 4x squared minus 27x minus 18, um, and I have to solve this thing, well, I don't have a quartic equation or formula that's nice and easy. It's actually horrible. And I don't want to factor this thing because I'm going to likely have to split some stuff up and I don't know how to split it up. But if I had some uh, factors, like if someone told me, hey, or if there was a theorem later on that told me, hey, x minus 2 and x plus 3 are factors, I can use this factor theorem in synthetic division to um, verify that x minus 2 and x plus 3 are factors. And then I can create a depressed equation that I can then solve. So let's, let's try this. So if I have 2, x minus 2 means 2 is a root. And then I set up my synthetic division. And I go ahead and synthetically divide. I get uh, 4, 11. 22, negative 18, oh, sorry, can't add, that's positive 18, um, 36, 9, 18, 0. So that means that indeed x minus 2 is a factor. And so now instead of verifying that x plus 3 is a factor of the original, what I'm going to use is this depressed equation this third degree equation where the x minus 2 has been divided out. And so I'm going to check negative 3 with this version, not the original. Because if you think about it logically, if x plus 3 is a factor of the original, 
it has to be a factor of this one as well. And so then I do my synthetic division. I get 2, negative 6, 5, negative 15, 3, negative 9, and another 0, which by the factor theorem tells me that indeed x plus 3 is a factor. And so now I am going to deal with what's left over. And what's left over is 2x squared plus 5x plus 3 equals 0. And that's a quadratic that I can then solve using completing the square or the quadratic formula or maybe even factoring if I'm lucky. And I can find the other two factors. So all I need now is, well, since I have this factor theorem, I can create these easier equations to solve only if I have these factors. What we are going to look at now is this fundamental theorem of algebra. It's the theorem that, well, makes algebra work the way it does. So the first version of, the, of this theorem was uh, proven by Gauss, and here's his version. And what he was able to prove was that every polynomial equation with complex coefficients and positive degree has at least one complex root. And that's not a very powerful statement. Uh, later on, mathematicians progressed further in their uh, proofs, and they were able to prove this theorem, which is really what makes algebra work the way it does. It says that every polynomial equation with complex coefficients and positive degree n has exactly n complex roots. So that means that the degree tells you how many roots there are. So quadratics of degree 2 have two roots. Cubics of degree 3 have three roots. Um, quintics, meaning fifth degree polynomials, have five roots. And what makes this work is realizing that any multiple root will count as many times as they appear. So if I have something like y equals x plus 1 quantity squared, I have a double root at negative 1, and so that would count twice in this fundamental theorem of algebra. Or if I had like y equals x cubed, I have a triple root at 0. So according to this fundamental theorem of algebra, 0 counts 3 times, and that's what makes this thing uh, provable. And this is really what makes algebra work the way it does. If I didn't have this connection, then I would have no idea how many roots there were when I'm solving an equation. So all the solving um, kind of revolves around this. And there are three fundamental theorems that you will learn in mathematics, and this is the fundamental theorem of algebra. You may have noticed that these polynomial theorems, the concepts behind them um, are kind of obvious, or at least they're obvious, in, uh, they seem obvious in the work you've been doing, or we've been taking them for granted, like all through learning, you know, algebra. Um, but they're actually quite difficult to prove, and we don't prove them in Algebra 2. You probably won't prove them at all until, unless you take uh, something like algebraic structures in college. So let's look at this conjugate root theorem, and it really does make sense when you think about it. It says if a polynomial equation with real, 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 coefficients has a plus bi as a root, where b is not equal to zero, meaning you're guaranteed to have an imaginary root, then a minus bi also has to be a root. And that makes sense because a number times its conjugate is going to give you something real. And we know the way factors work and the way roots work is you multiply them together using your various distributions, right? And so if I knew I had an imaginary root, meaning a factor with an imaginary number, but my coefficients were originally real numbers, then those imaginary parts had to cancel out and so that's what the conjugate root theorem says. And so what this does for us is if I know one imaginary root, then I automatically know the other one. So if a polynomial has real coefficients and I know one of the roots, say, is 7 plus 2i, then I know the other root has to be 7 minus 2i, which makes solving uh, pretty easy um, because I can knock out two roots with a single, knowing a single root. But of course, it's assuming that my coefficients were real to begin with. If I can have imaginary coefficients, then this does not work 
at all. So let's just look at an example. Let's say I want to find um, roots. So I have 2x cubed minus x squared plus 10x minus 5 equals 0. And I tell you one root is i root 5. Then I automatically know by the conjugate root theorem that negative i root 5 is the other root. And by the fundamental theorem of algebra, I know I have three roots. And so I can use synthetic division um, to find the last root. Or I can just multiply out x minus i root 5 and x plus i root 5 and then do a division to get that last root. So that's how the conjugate root theorem is going to help us. If I know one root is imaginary and the coefficients were real, then the other root is the conjugate.